This was not a mistake. This was not an accident. Emanuela Orlandi was taken for a very specific reason. What the hell kind of mess have you gotten me into, Enrico? Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpott and I cover true crime and missing person cases on my channel. Let's get straight into today's case. This is the missing person case of Emanuela Orlandi. Emanuela Orlandi was the fourth of five children in an Italian family that lived inside the Vatican City. Already an unusual start to this case because of how few citizens actually lived there. Her father was known to have served seven popes within the Vatican, but I mean, in what capacity, it's not really, it's just a little hazy. Emanuela, at the time of her disappearance, was 15 years old and she was attending high school in Rome. She was heavily involved in music. She played the flute, the piano, and sang in the Santana dei Palafer Palafrenieri Choir, as well as loving listening to music in general. You know, before I go any further, there are a lot of Italian names here. I'm not gonna do them justice. I'm gonna try my best. I, I I don't know. So over the summer she attended music school for flute lessons three times a week. On the 22nd of June 1983, Emanuela had one of her flute lessons. It was a day just like any other. So she made her way to music school and later that day she called one of her sisters sometime between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. and let her know that she'd received a job offer. A man who was representative of Avon Cosmetics had approached her and offered her a job. Now I know 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. is a big gap, but the reason I say this is this is what her sister specifically said. Uh, 5 p.m. is significant because that's when her music lesson was apparently. 7 p.m. is when she was supposed to meet up with her sister, but we'll get to that in a second. So that's fine, right? She got this cool job offer and what 15 year old doesn't want a little bit of money for themselves? She told him she would let him know once she asked her parents which is what she was trying to do when she called home that day, but her parents weren't home at the time and it was her sister who answered. So at 7 p.m. that day, like I said, Emanuela had plans to meet one of her sisters and some friends. The others arrived at the meeting place at 7 p.m., but Emanuela wasn't there. Once half an hour had passed and she still hadn't shown up, they assumed maybe she'd just gone straight home, maybe she'd forgotten about it, something like not too deep, you know? When her sister returned home and noticed that Emanuela had never actually come home that day, that's when the family began to worry. By 9.30, there was still no sign of her and they were in a complete panic. Bear in mind, they lived inside the Vatican City. Emanuela's music school was outside the gates of the Vatican City and the Vatican closes its gates at midnight. So they didn't know if they should be looking inside the gates or outside the gates. Her family searched hospitals, they searched around Rome, they brought her photograph, but all of this turned up not a single clue. So the following day, they reported her disappearance to the police. And ugh, the police told them, ah, wouldn't worry about it. She's not really pretty enough to have been abducted. F ew. And you know, she probably just ran away, no big deal. So at 6 p.m. on the 23rd of June, that same day that Emanuela was reported missing, a mysterious phone call came in. The person on the phone claimed to be a 16 year old boy named Pierre Luigi. And according to him, right, he and his girlfriend met Emanuela that afternoon in the Piazza Navona. Only he didn't use the name Emanuela. He used the name Barbarella. But what was really interesting was he mentioned the girl's flute and he gave a physical description that matched Emanuela. He claimed that this girl had just had a haircut and that she had run away from home and was selling Avon products. So generally when physical descriptions match, that doesn't really do much in my brain unless it's something super specific. But how specific is this comment about Avon? Like she had told her sister, oh yeah, I got approached by a guy who wants me to do this Avon thing. And now this person on the phone is mentioning Avon specifically. So if there is some truth to what he's saying, let's just look at this for a sec, right? Why would she run away from home? Generally, teenagers will run away if things are just too overwhelming or something really bad is happening. 
so it was there like was there something really bad going on as a 15 year old girl there are so many emotions and hormones rushing through your body at a great rate and it may not even look like anything is really going wrong from the outside looking in but maybe she was struggling with something five days later then on the 28th of june another phone call came in but this time it came directly to the family. This man said that his name was Mario and that he owned a bar near Ponte Vittorio, which was between the Vatican and her music school. Okay, he said that a girl called Barbara, a new customer of his, had told him she was a runaway, but that she would return for her sister's wedding. Because allegedly her sister was getting married in September and Emanuela was to play the flute at the wedding. He mentioned that she was a good looking girl with dark hair and that she was gonna be doing something for a concert for school, but this time she was gonna be singing rather than playing an instrument. This was true. She was set to sing in the choir for this concert and those details hadn't been released publicly. So it seems kind of legit. On Sunday the 3rd of July then, Pope John Paul II appealed to those responsible for her disappearance. But <laughs> Emanuela was missing, yes, but there could have been a number of reasons for this and kidnapping or having some one or some group of people responsible for her disappearance is only one of many potential causes. Two days after this, the Orlandi family received a number of anonymous phone calls stating that Emanuela was a prisoner of a terrorist group that were demanding the release of Mehmet Ali Ajka. Now this was a Turkish man who was imprisoned for shooting the Pope in May of 1981. Ajka had started to open up about who informed him to try and kill the Pope and without going into the nitty gritty, honestly confusing details, it seemed that whoever did get him to do this wanted to silence him, which could only be done by freeing him. <coughs> Soviet Union. <laughs> On the 8th of July then, a man called to say Emanuela was in his hands and he introduced a deadline. He said, you have 20 days to release Ali Ajka in exchange for the girl. The deal was, if they didn't release Ali Ajka by then, they would kill Emanuela. They also informed a news agency that there was a package in the square near the parliament that contained proof that Emanuela was actually in his hands. And they did find this package and it contained copies of Emanuela's music school ID, a receipt for a tuition payment to the music school, and a handwritten note by Emanuela saying, with much affection, your Emanuela. When this note was shown to her family, they were absolutely sure that this was her handwriting. So that may prove that she was in their possession, was in their possession, but could it prove that she still was? Like, could it prove that she was still alive? A lot of question marks about that. So another phone call came in then that was from a man who ended up being dubbed the American due to his accent, naturally. 16 calls were made from the American from different public phone booths and in one of these calls, he played a recording over the phone of Emanuela's voice, or at least what he claimed to be Emanuela's voice. But when her family actually heard this recording, they did not have a single doubt that this absolutely was her voice. It gave them chills to hear this voice because that is one of the first things that you forget about someone. This was a few weeks after she went missing. After this, he said, officials will be in touch very soon. A few hours later then, the same man called the Vatican and stated that Mario and Pierre Luigi from the previous calls were members of the same organization. What the hell is going on here? There is so much that's intermingled but not. I, there is, uh, I'm really only getting to the very, very, very beginning of it. Let's bring it back to this deadline that had been set from the alleged kidnappers, this 20 day thing, right? When these 20 days came to an end and it was deadline day, there was huge suspense in the air. Like the expectation was that they would find Emanuela's body somewhere. A call came through that morning around 10.30 a.m. from the American saying that she was very much alive and he was asking for a gesture to resolve matters because remember there was that whole thing with Ali Ajka. And he said, you only have a few hours left. But they didn't release him. 
But they also didn't find Emanuela that day. In essence, nothing really happened on that day, at least as far as we know. Now, as time moved on, more and more groups began to claim responsibility for kidnapping Emanuela. And obviously, not all of them could be telling the truth. Like, it doesn't make sense. But my question is, what if none of them were? I know Pierre Luigi and Mario and the American were doing this at the very beginning, but what if they were just the first to think of it? But then I suppose they did have insider knowledge. But maybe they got that from some contact, who knows? So now we're looking at years passing and we're gonna fast forward to 2005 when Pope John Paul II died. A few weeks after this, an anonymous tip came in saying, if you want to know what happened to Emanuela Orlandi, go and see who's buried at the Basilica of Santa Polinaire. This basilica is right beside what was Emanuela's music school. When this was investigated, an Italian crime boss was buried there, Enrico de Pettis, one of the heads of the Banda della Magliana, which was strange already because you can only be buried in this place if you got special permission or you paid a very big favour to the Vatican. And it was even weirder because like, he was a crime boss. He wasn't even just an average dude. <laughs> he was a, a bad dude. But it is important to note that he did have very strong connections with important people in the Vatican. This leads us to somebody else who began to speak out called Sabrina Minardi, who was Enrico de Pettis' lover at the time of Emanuela's disappearance. Now I know this is getting a little confusing, there's a lot of people, so if you have to take notes on your phone, do it, because it is worth it, the amount of like connections and weirdness that goes on in this case, or that seems to, or maybe definitely does, I, I don't know. <laughs> so according to Sabrina Minardi, right? De Pettis had her allow this young girl to stay in her house for a few days, okay? He basically begged her, like, right, it's just gonna be for, for a few days, just we need to keep her somewhere, okay? It's ended up being 10 full days, and during that 10 days, a woman called Adelaide would come over and take care of this girl, right? Feed her, wash her, and continually drug her to keep her calm and quiet, because she was, she was locked in a room. And not allowed to escape. Naturally, sharing a house with this girl, Sabrina became very familiar with how she looked and it really didn't take her long to realise that this was Emanuela Orlandi. Her response was like, what the hell kind of mess have you gotten me into, Enrico? She was not for it at all, but at the same time this was kind of a lot bigger than her. But after these 10 days, this girl was moved to a house in Monteverde, which had quote huge basements and Sabrina was told to go to some bar, pick up this girl and bring her to this petrol station in the Vatican and she was told that at the petrol station there will be a person with a Vatican City license plate who will take her and deliver her to the next place or to the next person. She thought about letting her go free but what she said was that she just couldn't possibly out of fear for her own safety and the fact that this was so much bigger than her. But who knows, I mean, it feels like a such a lost opportunity there. But when she drove her to this place, right, it was a priest that got out of this car, the other car with the Vatican license plate. Or, okay, it was a priest or somebody who was dressed as a priest, right? We don't know if it was an actual priest. And that was kind of the last she had seen or heard of this girl, okay? What I will say is, this is just Sabrina Minardi's story, right? Like, there's no proof of any of this, although after some investigation, certain things that she had said were actually found to be true, specifically about the second location um, in Monteverde, this apartment. And within this apartment, apparently a wall had been built, creating a secret room. <sighs> the perfect place for a secret prisoner. Huh? Now, it was around this time that there had been whispers going around that money had been given to Enrico de Pettis from the Mafia, and this money somehow ended up in Vatican banks and hadn't been paid back. <sighs> Not the kind of people you want to get on the bad side of, particularly with large amounts of money. So, 
there were question marks like were the kidnappers looking for ransom money from the Vatican? I mean I'm sure the Vatican would keep information like this pretty secret if so, but who knows. The next witness that came forward, I'm just gonna mention it in passing, right? Because he has a weird but potentially fake connection to this case. It's really questioned highly, but I am just gonna mention it because it, there is also a kind of potentially legit connection. So I, I don't know, I'll leave it up to you, but I just wanna give you this piece of information. And I'm not gonna even say his real name because I don't think he deserves the attention. I think that might be, all he really wants. So Leonardo comes forward with Emanuela's flute, or what we're told to believe is Emanuela's flute, right? The rod to clean the flute inside it was missing, which made sense because Emanuela's one was kept by her sister. And I was so curious to find out that like when they ran the forensics, like what actually came about? Like, did, could they confirm this was her flute? And as for that, it, it's unclear. I don't think they ever really came back with the answers. If they did, I couldn't find that anywhere. So that's really unfortunate because this is the only thing that's potentially legitimate about this person. But what I will say is it is widely believed that this was in fact Emanuela's flute. But just keep that in mind, okay? So Leonardo claims that he was the American from way back when and he was so disgustingly smug in announcing that. Like, he was like, yes, I was responsible. I created the Orlandi case, like, as if it was something to be proud of creating. And according to him, Emanuela was tricked into coming with the kidnappers, being told that they needed to stage a fake kidnapping in attempt to save her father from losing his job. And this fake kidnapping was just gonna be for a few days, but in actual fact, it turned into a real one. Like, a weird, weird story. Doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But through a ton of media attention and even meeting with Emanuela's brother face to face, he couldn't really provide any proper information. Like, anything that hadn't been publicly released. Anything he was questioned on, he was like, oh, well, I mean, you try and remember, it was so long ago. Yeah, but that's not good enough here. Like, we need you to prove that you are actually legit in what you're saying right now. But everything he said was pretty much public knowledge. And let's also be aware of the fact that Leonardo had a pretty intense criminal history. He had a questionable relationship with a 17 year old girl. I'm not sure what age he was at this time. And he was also convicted of manslaughter of a 12 year old. So, you know. How much do we really want to believe someone like this? And when he was investigated properly, digital forensic experts compared his voice with the recordings of the American from back in July of 1983. And this I was fascinated by. I was like, okay, tell me if this is the same voice. And they determined that he was not a match. However, he was a match for all of the calls claiming to be the American between September and December of 1983. So there were two of them. The first one only ever mentioned one missing girl, Emanuela. And the second one mentioned another missing girl, Mirella Gregori, who disappeared 45 days before Emanuela. And our Leonardo, well, he spoke about Mirella Gregori and how there was a connection between her and Emanuela Orlandi. Some even said that Leonardo was obsessed with Morella Gregori. Maybe he did actually have legitimate knowledge on her disappearance. Who knows? Even more recently, another few years later, a very telling and interesting story came out. A woman claiming to have been best friends with Manuela back in school. She tells her story about something that happened only a few days before Manuela's disappearance. Emanuela said to her, I have to tell you a secret. So naturally this, like they're 15. So this friend is like, ooh, is it about a boy? Like, ooh, exciting. And technically it was, but not in the way typical teenagers would or should be talking about it. So what had happened was during one of Emanuela's walks through the Vatican Gardens, 
she was approached by somebody. Somebody she described as very close to the Pope and that he bothered her. Now these are the exact words he used. The friend doesn't go into detail about what that meant, but all she says is that this person made several advances on her. We don't know the extent of this. Did something happen, actually physically happen, or was it just insinuated that something was going to happen, or this person wanted something to happen? You know what I'm saying, like this is um, a real grey area. It being back in 1983 and the Catholic Church being what it was, Emanuela was terrified and also so ashamed to even be saying this out loud about someone so high up in the Vatican because you were supposed to see priests, cardinals, popes as these holy people to worship them essentially and to you know, to tell even your parents about this would not, not be taken the same way it would today. Particularly anywhere outside of the Vatican City, for example. I even remember a close family member of mine telling me about going to school and the nuns being very violent in their punishments to, you know, this specific family member and the other students. What if my family member told even their parents about this? This would not have gone down well. The child themselves was always made out to have asked for it in some way, was never seen as a victim because these religious figures, it's like they had this shield around them by being so holy and all-knowing and, oh, that's going to be a controversial one, and anything they said or did was right and just. And I mean, we all know the history of the Catholic Church. But... Even at that, nothing had ever come out about, and I, that was mainly in the 90s, I think. So definitely in 1983, nothing had ever, ever come out about things like this happening literally inside the Vatican, where the holiest of the holy live. Something like this could literally ruin the entire church, the entire religion. So naturally it would be within the Vatican's interest to do whatever it takes to keep something like this from getting out. So keep this in mind when we go into this next angle. In 2012, you might have heard about it, a bunch of confidential documents were released pertaining to really intense corruption within the Vatican. It was dubbed the nickname Vatileaks. This included documents on Emanuela Orlandi, apparently. These documents had been hidden inside a safe in the Vatican for 30 years. And according to this one document, it explained the domestic removal of the citizen Emanuela Orlandi. It shows costs covered by the Vatican for food, travel, accommodation, get this, in London from 1983 to 1997. <sighs> Just got chills. There was also an address documented in there which turned out to be a youth hostel for girls in London which was owned by a religious Catholic congregation with an extremely strong connection to the Vatican. And the final expense in there was for, and I quote, general activity and transfer to the Vatican City State with relative handling of the final paperwork. Which sounds like, sounds like she had died in London and someone brought her body back to the Vatican, which, is not that big, which means it was only going to be maximum, what, a, a few hundred meters from her home? <laughs> and if this is legit, then like, it's so, it's insane. Particularly for these very religious people who have only ever seen the good in the Vatican and in the church in general. But, but, is this document even legitimate? Or is it another way to draw attention away from the real truth? I just, I don't know. Would they, even if it was kept in a safe, like hidden away for 30 years, would they really even keep a paper trail of this? Like, would they not just want it to disappear into the past and never ever have to acknowledge it happening again? Like having a paper trail means that 
at some point somebody else is going to take on this knowledge whether they be really high up and have the caliber to be allowed to have those secrets or it being leaked <laughs> I mean so later another tip comes in that said to find Emanuela they would have to look in these particular tombs within the Vatican and the Vatican actually agreed to open them up which was kind of surprising to some people it's like admitting some amount of guilt however absolutely nothing was found in these tombs which was particularly strange because there were I believe two tombs that were opened up and in one of them there were said to be princesses that were buried there so why were they not there like there was nothing there N no bones no evidence nothing and when I found this out I just thought hmm were remains there previously and removed like just in the nick of time like maybe they had some kind of insider knowledge that these tombs would be opened up and there would be pressure to open them up and maybe they could remove any remains before the fact i'm just gonna go down a little rabbit hole here right this tip that came in pointed in the direction of these two particular tombs okay that could potentially have Emanuela in there if remains had been there and had been removed just in the nick of time maybe whoever was removing them you know so much time has passed like maybe you can't actually tell which of these remains are Emanuela or these princesses so maybe it was just safer to remove them all have no idea gonna put it out there and then I thought maybe with the Vatican agreeing to open these tombs this was a way for them to pretend they're cooperating when they knew actually nothing was in those tombs and nothing could possibly come out this is mad right another thing that happened way back on the very day Emanuela disappeared a phone call came in to the Vatican press office from a mysterious man claiming responsibility for the kidnapping of Emanuela Orlandi and immediately blackmailing them for money. And this call came in on the day she disappeared. Bear in mind, she wasn't actually reported missing until the next day. So obviously, if this is true, if this claim about this phone call is true, this was legit. These were her real kidnappers because even the police didn't know yet. Then there was another instance where Emanuela's family met the Pope, Pope Francis that is, and he said to them, Emanuela is in heaven. Clearly, there has never been any evidence of her being dead. So her brother responded, my hope is that she's still alive. To which Pope Francis repeated, Emanuela is in heaven. <sighs> How does he know this? Why is he so adamant? I, I, oh God, I actually don't, I'm this speechless. It's just, why is everything looking so sketchy? Like, let's be real and just look at all of this, right? There are little bits of each of these theories that have turned out to be true. So maybe it's not one of these theories, but a combination of them. And something I can't stop thinking about is the crime boss, Enrico de Pettis, who was buried in a place where you could only be buried if you had special permission from the Vatican or you did the Vatican a huge favor. <sighs> Again, he was a crime boss, one of the bosses of the Banda della Magliana, which is like pretty intense. This would have to be a huge favor for him to do, to be buried in this place, no? And he was said to have very strong connections with the Vatican. Maybe the Vatican realized, oh shit, this girl could speak out about these sexual advances that have been made on her in the Vatican Gardens. This cannot get out. We need someone to help us get rid of her or silence her. Side note, maybe Emanuela threatened this as she got away from this person. Some people even think that maybe she fell pregnant by somebody high up in the church and that's why they had to get rid of her. I thought about the timing of this. Surely some time would have to go by between this happening and her going missing because like, you know, you don't just find out two days after you, you know, that you're pregnant. So maybe she only told the best friend a few days before she went missing. But if the Vatican was like, you know what, we need to get rid of her for whatever reason, who better to get rid of her or silence her than a crime boss? Someone who knows how to get away with things. So maybe one of DePettis' people approached her as the Avon man, potentially, which ended up with her being kidnapped and 
then brought to Sabrina Minardi's house for those 10 days before being moved around a bit. Everything gets a little hazy after that. Maybe this is more complicated and there are actually layers. Like maybe there is a financial scandal going on here. Maybe there was blackmail. Because if somebody like Enrico de Pettis knew about this kidnapping or was responsible for this kidnapping, then he couldn't have been the only one to know because he needed other people to pull it off because this money, remember that money laundering issue where the mafia's money somehow went via Enrico de Pettis and ended up in the Vatican banks? Maybe the Vatican were being blackmailed and saying, hey, look, give us our money back or we're going to release this girl and she's going to speak out about what you did to her. Obviously, the Vatican is always going to deny this. They will always hide information like this. <laughs> There were also whispers that Emanuela was used for sex parties in the Vatican. One priest claimed this specifically and that officials of an unnamed foreign embassy were involved as well. Obviously, I don't know. I don't know what happened. It's not very clear. The case is confusing. The theories are all over the place. But interestingly, if you look at all of those theories in detail, all of them somehow lead back to the Vatican and not just because that's where she was from, at least in my opinion. As of now, Emanuela's disappearance is still unsolved. Her father passed away in 2004 and shortly before he died, he stated that he was betrayed by those he served. So even he thought way back in 2004 that the Vatican was involved or was responsible in some way. Emanuela's mother is now 92 years old. Who knows how much time she has left and it is just far too tragic for her to die and not know what happened to her daughter. That's one of the things with missing person cases that just breaks my heart every time I even go there mentally because one day your son or daughter disappears and then you're just never gonna find out. You're, you get to the point where your life ends or is about to end and you still don't know like it's horrific and look chances are Emanuela is not still alive but this family needs closure and we can only hope that they do get it someday everyone says the simplest answer is usually the right one but honestly I don't even know what the simplest answer is in this case where a 15 year old girl disappeared never to be seen again and there's ties to the mafia, money laundering, Ali Ajka, stuff in the Vatican, like there's so much. No, no, none of it is simple. As always, I would really love to know what you think happened to Emanuela or Landy in this case. Do you think it's something as simple as her running away? Or is there just too much smoke without fire in this one? If so, whose smoke do you think is the smokiest? Let me know in the comments below and if you're not already make sure you're subscribed and you hit the notification bell so that you never miss these uploads and if you enjoyed this video make sure you watch this one next and i will see you beauties in two weeks time all right bye guys